I think it's amazing when women especially really rise up to help other women and empower other women to be successful because I believe that's what's going to shake and change this world. It's just an incredible blessing to get to do what I do. From To Be Magnetic, this is The Expanded Podcast with your host, Lacey Phillips. And your host, Jessica Gill. As the leading destination for neural manifestation, we dispel the woo-woo in order to help you create real, tangible results based on neuroplasticity, psychology, epigenetics, and energetics. Our goal is to normalize the practice of manifestation and empower you to get into the driver's seat of your life in order to manifest the experiences, relationships, and things that most align with your authenticity. And by pressing play, the process begins. Welcome back everyone to another episode of Expanded, Jessica here. Instead of giving you my breakdown summary of today's episode, I actually wanted to share what our copywriter, Allie, put together after listening through the episode. She really has such a way to nail the essence and the inspiration from each episode. And so I felt like just reading it out today would give you everything you all need to know. Every now and then you'll hear someone tell their story and you're reminded of that big, grandest truth of life. Everything is connected. Your blocks, your limiting beliefs, the trauma you experienced, your relationship dynamics, your authenticity, your path to healing, it's all related. And to take it one step further, we're all connected to each other. Your healing is collective healing. That is the vibe of the episode today with Pathway member Lisa. This episode is the reminder that we all need that there is a bigger story playing out here every single day of our life. Lisa and I cover all kinds of topics from trust issues to integrating feedback you don't want to hear to doing conscious business to cutting off a parent to manifesting animals. It'd probably be easier to list what we don't talk about than what we do, to be honest. If you need expansion around launching a business, getting paid to do the things you love, cultivating abundance physically and emotionally, this healing conversation was recorded for you because remember, we are all connected. Well freaking written, Allie. Great job there. And I'm so excited for you all to listen to this episode. Really let any part of her story that resonates sink in. The messages that you hear today are meant for you to hear. So enjoy. We have one week left for our early bird ticket pricing for our New York City speaking tour event with Lacey and I. We are diving into the love money connection. What does your magnetic self truly desire when it comes to love and money? What are you craving? What do you want to call in? And what is the archetype that you tend to fall in when it comes to how you approach love and money? How can that be blocking you? How can you unblock with our brand new deep imagining and start to manifest what you truly desire in both love and money, whatever that looks like for you. Our early bird ticket pricing is our discounted ticket pricing is closing out next week on August 25th at midnight PST. So be sure to snag the lowest rate you can get the speaking tour tickets for by next Friday. And then they will go up to full price after that. We are so excited to see you all on tour and help you navigate this love money connection. And now a word from our partners. Speaking of manifestations, one major manifestation that has come through for me recently is Bond Charge's infrared PEMF mat. Their PEMF mat, which stands for Pulse Electromagnetic Field, is a magnetic energy mat that sends energy waves to work with your body's natural magnetic field and improve your overall well-being. Now, I originally heard of PEMF mats back in the day. I used the first one at Lacey's Forest Retreat House, and I kind of didn't really think it was going to do anything at first. And when I laid on this mat, I'm telling you, my whole body just relaxed. My nervous system relaxed, and I fully was able to calm down. Fast forward a few years later, one of our absolute favorite companies, Bond Charge, has launched their own PEMF mat and it is 
fully loaded with all the best biohacking techniques you can imagine. So not only do they have multiple frequency settings, one for delta waves to improve deep sleep, one for grounding and earthing that is in the frequency of Schumann's resonance, which is the earth's magnetic field frequency, one for alpha waves to increase calm creativity, one for beta waves for logical thinking, conscious thought or meditation, and one that cycles through all four to really align all different parts of your body. But that's not all. They also have red, near infrared, and far infrared light wave frequencies. You've heard me talk about this before, but red light therapy can be so impactful for muscle soreness, tension, pain in the body, detoxification, and so many more things. It is also packed with tourmaline gemstones, germanium gemstones, and amethyst crystals, which all help to balance your mood, keep you calm, activate spiritual awareness, open intuition, and attract positive ions from your body to keep you in that balanced state. Like I said, this thing is fully loaded. So once we received it, we unloaded it into our living room and it honestly hasn't left the floor because I find myself jumping on it multiple times a day when I want to meditate before the start of my day or when I'm needing to process and do a DI. It helps to take me deeper, calm my body, calm my nervous system. It is so good for meditation practices. It just helps you go a lot deeper. And when you are needing grounding breaks throughout the day, it is fantastic. So if you are interested in trying Bon charges new infrared pemf mat you can use the code magnetic that's all caps m-a-g-n-e-t-i-c for 15 percent off again that's magnetic m-a-g-n-e-t-i-c for 15 percent off or you can go to bondcharge.com backslash pages backslash magnetic and check out some of the other incredible biohacking low emf products that bond charge has to offer All right, on to the episode. Welcome, Lisa, to the Expanded Podcast. I'm so excited to have you on. Thank you for having me. I'm excited to be here. Okay, so you're familiar with the podcast and the opening questions. Do you know your sun, moon, and rising sign? So I actually do, and I, I knew, obviously, sun is the easiest, so I'm a Gemini. Um, my moon's Libra, and my rising is Virgo. Oh, very cool. So how do you feel like each of them reflect in you? The Gemini, I do have duality in a sense of I'm, I'm both very internal processor and very verbal. And so there's a lot of different nuances to the Gemini that I think really lay in the forefront. However, as I've aged, I think the Libra really comes into play because, you know, I do like to look at everything from multiple angles and see the fairness and things. And I think that's where that can come into play. So what is your cultural background and upbringing? I mainly grew up in uh, Southern California, actually, in Orange County. And while I think there's a lot of, from publicity and TV and stuff, there's a perception of Orange County that is rings really true, but our family was a little different. My mom, it's like she comes from evangelical Downton Abbey style, like very poised European background, a lot of pastors and missionaries in the family. And then on my dad's side, he was more, what's the show? A Tiger King. (laughs) (laughs) Like Southern, um, if I can say white trash, Southern white trash and um, very gritty. And while they both are Caucasian, came from exceedingly different cultures. My mom's side was very refined and very very religious focused. And actually my dad's side too, but in a really different way. In the household, uh, my mom was a a codependent peacekeeper and my dad was very unpredictable and volatile. And there was a lot of chaos with him. And, you know, we didn't know when we were younger how much chaos there really was. It it came, a lot of things surfaced as I grew more into being an adult. It's hard because I look back and there are so many positive things that kind of yin and yang with um, some of the negative. We got to have a very active life with animals and um, I had a beehive growing up and all sorts of things. And I'm in like the middle of suburbia, you know, and living like I'm in the country. So which was really, really fun. What were some of the lessons? I always I always like to think back. I think we had a section in in the magnetic self challenge of this, too. But like when you think back on the lessons you've learned in life and the things you've had to work through, what are some of those elements? Like when I think of myself, you know, my parents' divorce led me to understanding 
what trust issues were, you know what I mean? For and what sure. that meant and having to process that and, and strive for a completely secure relationship versus codependency. So what were maybe some of the lessons that you learned through childhood? First of all, you're not responsible for other people's emotions. I think one of the things that's so hard when you're young and growing up in a household where temper one temperament controls and dictates the environment for the group, I, I always grew up kind of questioning if I adjust enough, can it be peaceful? And so re- I think as I've gotten older, and especially more in the last couple of years, realizing that you're not responsible, I'm not responsible for other people's emotions and, and being okay with the discomfort that comes with somebody else being in a different space. So I think that was one thing. Another thing, it's so easy to internalize what somebody else is putting out in the universe, but 99% of what we're all doing really has to do with what's going on on the inside of ourselves. And so I've really grown to have so much compassion for both my parents in the sense that they were doing the very best that they could. And a lot of it was unhealthy and some of it was really destructive and sad, but it's because brokenness was at play, you know? And so, um, and this process actually in just the last couple of years, I've been able to get through so much anger and resentment and a sense of not victimization, but a sense of what I didn't have versus looking at what I really did get. It's so freeing to be on the other side of that. I, I also want to highlight here, cause I know people have made comments on this in the past that, you know, when we say they're doing the best they can, that's not to excuse the shitty behavior. It is a both and. It is they are doing the best that they are physically capable, mentally, whatever their resource faculties are able to give, and you still need boundaries. You still need protection. What they did was not okay. doesn't excuse bad behavior. Definitely doesn't excuse abusive behavior. It's both things are true. For sure. There's still justice that I think can happen, especially within respect to my, with my father, like there was a lot of illegal activity. So there's a lot of things where I, I can look at that and be hurt for the child and the home that he grew up in and know that that's why he became what he became. Yet I also can step aside and and, and hurt for the child, but also know that the adult is accountable and know that while he was doing the best he could, he, he very well could have taken steps to, to heal and to face face a number of things that would have allowed him to be a better parent, a better individual in society and like a more present individual and things of that nature. So there definitely is duality there for sure. How did the healing work bring you to TBM? I I think I'm one of many when I say this, but good old Mark Groves. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah, no, I absolutely, I can't sing his praises enough. I am a huge, huge fan. But I I started off, um, a friend of mine had done one of his courses and I was really struggling after a breakup more because the person I'd been dating gave me some hard truths when we broke things off. And I was really looking inward going, I think there's some, while the spirit of it, of his statements wasn't the nicest, it was actually, there was wisdom there where I'm like, I need to listen to this. And I was talking it through with a friend and she's like, I think you should do this Mark Gross course. And, and so I did his wholeness course and it was gnarly. It was great. And then afterwards I was thinking like, okay, what next? At the time I'd kind of been um, struggling with being sick and having some, some issues with my body and going to the doctor and, and realizing that a lot of what I was struggling with was untended to anxiety and years of trauma that had just kind of built up. And so I had heard Lacey on Mark Gross podcast a couple of times, and I'd really been listening to TBM um, to Expanded. And so I decided to join. I joined actually, it's about two years ago. At the time I've joined TBM, I start doing the inner child work And simultaneously, I'm going to an internist at UCLA, and they basically, you know, had advised me that my intestines were actually in knots slightly upside down, and I might need surgery to rectify horrible digestion issues. And it was amazing. I got a physician that was just so compassionate, and she basically said, like, I want to acknowledge that something in your life has been really traumatic for a really, really long time, because it takes decades for this to happen. I loved that she combined Eastern and Western medicines. We kind of put a protocol together where I started going to acupuncture. I went to an energy healer. I was doing TBM and I was doing DIs like one a day, sometimes three times a day. What I would do is just during lunch and stuff, take a pause and 
just shut my eyes and do like a 20 minute DI and then maybe journal a second time. And then I joined a hypnotherapy group as well. And it was a women's group where it was almost like a cross between we would do hypnotherapy in the group, but the therapist would do these targeted like mental releases and blocks and stuff like that. And it actually corresponded really well with TBM. Yeah. Yeah. I can imagine. It sounds like amazing. Yeah. So I did it for like six months and it was really, that group was integrated with TBM was a godsend because the inner child and boundary work was shutting me down. Like I would have to take breaks because the emotional weight and the the heaviness of the things that were coming forward were, were just incredible. And it's funny because I'd done therapy for years, but I had never gotten so deep into the subconscious of things that I'd been holding on to. So stuff just started surfacing. It was interesting. It's so fascinating how, like, I love understanding deeper on the tie-in between the body and the mind and our emotions and the subconscious, because they're all working as a system together. And we think of them as so siloed, but I mean, even like IBS, in recent years, which everyone thought was like, you know, maybe an anxiety disorder, whatever. One of the number one treatments for IBS is hypnotherapy. So you can calm your nervous system. Yep. So it's just wild. How did you start to understand the tie-in between the gut, the stored emotions, what was going on and needing to process through that? Like, was there a moment where you felt relief a little bit after doing, you know, a DI or something, or was it a gut feeling almost like, wow, I know these are tied together. How did you kind of put those things? I started feeling almost like triggered releases in my body randomly where one of the side effects was I was literally peeing all the time because my intestines were sitting in my uterus and my bladder. So they had talked to me about getting a hysterectomy and I tried a number of different bladder medications and none of them were working. And they're like, wait, how are none of these like helping with the urgency? And so then when they went in and saw through the CAT scan, they're like, oh, your intestines are literally sitting. There's nowhere for the urine to go. And so I started peeing less frequently They also realized that I had had a little bit of of nerve damage and wanted to put in a a pacemaker. And I went ahead and did that. But then I realized I've turned it off. Like, I don't even need it anymore. So, um, yeah, like, so I, it was more, the the urination actually probably was the biggest key because I could physically tell that the weight was releasing, but I was becoming more comfortable as well. We, we did a colonoscopy and we did a few other things. And it was like eight months after I had been doing all this work, she scheduled this colonoscopy. It had to be rescheduled because um, initially I, I didn't respond to some medication with it. So they pushed it out a little further. And by the time she did the colonoscopy, she was like, this is not the same body. I can't believe what I'm seeing. She's like, I've never seen such a drastic change. And so she asked me for all the references. She wrote down your website. <laughs> she got the hypnotherapist's information. She got my, the energy worker, the acupuncture. She wanted to know everybody. It was really interesting because she was, she took a lot of time to ask me a lot of questions about like, so when you say hypnotherapy, what do you mean? Can you explain, you know, what you're doing and talk to me about what these DIs are and like, what is it doing in the subconscious and stuff? So it was her level of intrigue was really amazing. That is really inspiring for a more traditional doctor in that realm to have interest in that sector. Usually it's so separated, but that is really hopeful. Yeah, an OBGYN and an internist and a specialist and teaches at UCLA. So, and she even reached out. She she's touched base with me a couple times since then about a few things. So I felt like I was in really good hands because I was a little upset. The first um, specialist I saw wanted to do a hysterectomy and like was recommending bowel surgery and stuff. And I'm like, there's got to be more here. So when I got to her, I was thrilled. When she first looked at my scan, she got teary-eyed and she just said, I want you to know I'm sorry. And she's like, whatever you've been through, I'm really, really sorry. And I started crying and she started crying and it was really, really sweet. When she said that to you, it's almost like a moment of physical recognition that, oh my gosh, all of these moments of my life had an impact and not just like in my mind, but in my body. Were you flooded with memories, emotions, feelings? Did you know exactly what the main source was? Was it one instance, many memories? What kind of came up there? I immediately felt, A, I felt really seen 
because for years right after college, I'd been really sick for a long time and had everything from IBS and all these other digestive issues that they couldn't detect. And doctors kind of thought I was crazy. And my mom believed in me. My dad did not, but my mom was like, no, something's wrong. And yet they couldn't. And I, maybe we just didn't have the capacity to look bigger picture. Cause that's over 20 years ago, 25 years ago. But, um, immediately I, I just felt like this sense of permission of I'm not crazy. And my body has been trying to tell me something for a really long time. The second thing is I had experienced trauma in the home and then some other trauma a little older. And initially I thought it actually was trauma from when I was older that I was holding on to until I really started doing the work with you guys and realizing how deep the level of trust and violations with my dad really went. He basically was living a double life and very, very religious. And so people on the outside thought that we had this picture perfect family and stuff, but I always felt really uncomfortable and very unsafe. And there was a lot of deceit and lying. I was the one that kind of siphoned it all out in my twenties and figured everything out like a, a detective. And that actually also made me feel not crazy. I think because I felt like, aha, I finally have gotten it. I thought I was able to heal from it, but really I hadn't. Once she kind of highlighted how this was so related to trauma. And I'd already started working with you guys, but I, it just made all the inner child stuff. Cause I ended up doing inner child, I think three times. Cause I kept having to go back. I would do inner child and then I'd go to like boundaries. And then I went back to inner child and then I went to love and money. And then I went back to inner child. And cause I could tell there was, I was going really slow, but I'm like, there's still more, but I need a break. It worked really well because I would stay sometimes on one section for days and just keep repeating the DI. And literally, as long as there was stuff that was coming up and I didn't feel completely at peace and I would just sit in it, you can really give yourself so much love and compassion and permission on your own to allow things to release and heal. I think it's a combination of seeing yourself, letting yourself fully witness what you experience through the lens of your your child eyes because as adults we can be like yeah well i mean that that couldn't have been that painful or like that wasn't that big of a deal but then through the lens of a very sensitive young innocent child who doesn't know better is learning about the world that can be the scariest life or death understanding or realization that they're having and so being able to go back in and be like okay let me get curious like what did my inner child witness and what what were they even feeling, you know? Cause I know what adult me is feeling about the situation now, but I don't really know what my inner child felt then. And then being able to reparent, I think is like, that's where so much shakes loose. One, I think there were so many things that I didn't really realize how they linked up and the gravity of them. One of the things that came out, so my dad was a really big personality and incredibly funny but also you were either loved by him and embraced to a level that was almost odd because you were perfect or you were literally hated and he wanted to make your life miserable. There really, there was no middle ground. And so there was a lot of drama that was always circulating. And I had no idea what I had tied to money and drama because as we as a family got more successful, as my father's business got more successful, the chaos increased. And there was also this association of my mom came from a philanthropic family. So we need to financially carry other people with us out of almost this Christian guilt of like having to be generous and benevolent. And then he is becoming bigger and more chaotic. So I carried this incredible amount of fear and paranoia around being great at something and being really good and and being seen too much and or being prosperous because it was going to bring chaos into my life and it would probably destroy relationships and I would maybe have to carry a train of people with me. I had all this stuff that I had no idea was was coming with all of these childhood feelings around security and love and money and stuff. Yeah, I remember there was one part in your submission where you were saying on the outside we were like making all this money, the company was growing or your dad's company was growing, but yet you were giving so much out to other people that like, it wasn't even reflected necessarily to all of the family members or to you guys as kids. It, Cause it was like almost 
in here and then giving out to others. So it was like this massive responsibility to even increase your financial situation. It was to the point like, you know, buying people cars and like giving away, like helping one of my former teammates' families save their house. And then we didn't have money for groceries at one point. And so I would go in and I could scan our cabinets and know how we were actually doing money wise by what food we had in the house, because I couldn't tell by the way we were actually living with like cars and certain things, like and the way we were gifting to other people. I had no idea where our actual financial status stood. And God bless my mom, because she bore the brunt of this to the nth degree and really figured out how to always make it work. But it was not easy. What was your financial and career, I guess, dynamics like prior to TBM and the work? And then after discovering this and being like, oh, shoot, that's what's going on. What transpired with career and finances? So prior to TBM, so I had always worked internationally, worked heavily in the beauty and cosmetic world, helping brands scale internationally. About 10 years ago, I started a consulting firm. I had been in a really bad car accident and had to have some surgeries and stuff. And so I couldn't travel quite as much and started consulting and ended up realizing I really liked it. And at the beginning of the pandemic, my consulting practice kind of crashed. I was heavily working in Asia and I was a little too invested in a solid three markets of Japan, China, and and Korea. So when the pandemic hit, my business took a pretty big blow. I had started a a new company right before joining TVM called Hustle & Blush. It's a basically a line of handmade goods. We work with women in, in disenfranchised markets and slightly tweak or modernize creations and make them a little more suitable for the modern consumer's home. And then we reinvest back into the market. And I had just started the company and was just getting going when I, I joined TBM. I knew I was living in purpose and was had was on to something, but to what extent, I didn't really know. I loved what I was doing, but I think I was floundering a bit on how comfortable I was in putting what I had out there and, and looking at really scaling it. So I think I was a little more reserved. Talk about some of the manifestations that have transpired, the tests specifically, and then into the manifestations around career. So basically with Hustle and Blush, we initially launched with um, a series of home goods out of the Western mountains of Ukraine, actually. We launched with about 55 women that made a number of blankets and bed runners and rugs and art and things. And in the process of launching that collection, COVID was in full scale and There were so many different setbacks from manufacturing processes to shipping delays to COVID shutdowns and things. And as that's all going on, I decided to create a smaller product that was a little easier to ship and in a different market so I could be a little more diversified. So that's when I created the Fluff U's, their dryer balls. These, we were working with a team of women in Nepal. So as I'm doing the work, I got this ping that I should send a gift box to clients in Korea. Back in when I was doing a lot of the consulting work, I was heavily working in more in medical devices, beauty devices, and then a lot of beauty products and cosmetics and things of that nature. And the partners that I worked with, as much as they know the home arena, they're really beauty focused. But I'm like, you know what? I'm just going to send them a gift box with a letter, like a note, a handwritten note. And so I did. And they got the box and we're like, what are these? (laughs) And um, part of it in Korea, only a small percentage of households even have a dryer. So I explained what they were and they decided they wanted to rep the brand and work with the brand. So we got to work on pitching the brand to TV home shopping shows and to some department stores and things of that nature. And the shop show I really wanted to be on, it has a celebrity host and she's, she's really famous. And Initially, the host liked us, but the shop show said no. And they really wanted me to adjust price and adjust a few things. And I just kind of stuck to my guns and was like, no, I just don't think it's the right fit then. So passing tests, just so everyone's like clocking, like followed a ping, a ping that logically didn't make sense because these people were in beauty, but she's pitching a home goods item. And then not only is that a yes, opens more doors, then it's like, okay, well, 
you can come in, but we're not really that jazzed about it. And you have to lower your price. And you're like, no, sorry. Like I know the value and the worth of this. Correct. Just want everyone to like clock the process there too. <laughs> and so then we started to pitching to department stores and the top three department stores said no. So then we went to, it's almost like a big box store, but yet it's a little, it'd be like if we combined Costco and Target. So they have a big box mentality, but they also have more standardized, easily navigatable stores that you can get a lot of products that moms would want. And they ended up wanting the line. And news in Korea travels really fast. The minute that they wanted our line, all of a sudden that original shop show with the host I really wanted came back and they're like, okay, we want the line. If they think they can sell it, it means we can sell it. We were ecstatic. It's the number one home shopping show for home goods in all of Korea. And so we got, went through a process of creating a, a specific set for them and got to where it was getting ready to ship. And we were supposed to be shipping in March. And my team in Nepal missed the ship deadline. I was even out in Nepal and they, we missed the deadline. And then they gave us a second deadline. So our original show was going to be in May. Then our second show was going to be in June. And so we missed the second deadline as well due to a quality control error. We end up, they said, if you don't hit the third shipping deadline, then we don't want your product. So we hit the third shipping deadline. And as punishment, the shop show put us into early July. In the home shopping world, there are months where you have really high viewership, and then there are months where viewership is lower. And July in Korea, the first couple of weeks of July is the heaviest travel season. It's when everybody has off work. And so it's the lowest viewership of the year, and the numbers are nowhere near what they would have been if they were in May. So they felt like they had about three times too much inventory for a show air date in July. So they had warned me prior to the show, we'll be happy if you sell 30% of your goods. I felt sick, Jessica. You, I, I thought I was going to throw up the whole time. I'm like, like as you're navigating this, like what are you doing for support to stay centered? A lot of meditating. A, <laughs> you know, it's funny. Like I've learned through years of this, but I've gotten in the last couple of years, I'm so much calmer. Like I don't really get rattled as much anymore. Stuff happens and I'm like, you know what? It generally works out. I think more than anything for me last year is I'm I'm on a tightrope in between the laid back, cool as a cucumber, easygoing, just sweet and kind nature of the Nepalese people where the, nothing is urgent and life and society moves at a pace that is slower. And then you have the Koreans on the other side where everything is punctual. It's literally like anti-handmade because they want everything perfect. Everything is held to an exactified standard. And I'm in the middle and, and having to navigate, educating both sides, kind of letting them know, okay, culturally, this is why they want it this way. And I, I'm doing it to both sides. It's been good for growth, but it's at times it's really stressful. Basically, so the show punished us, put us in July. We were hoping we would I, I'm like, please sell at least the 30%. It was about 9,000 sets of product. And um, they said they would then sell whatever was left on online thereafter. So the show airs and it's at like 4 a.m. my time. So I get up, but I'm like not even wanting to look at my screen. I'm like so nervous. And basically we sold out in under 15 minutes of a 30 minute show. Wow. And what's really cool in the home shopping world in Korea is that when a consumer orders, they get their product delivered in under two hours. And the show incentivizes them with a gift with purchase or a future discount to write a review with photos of the product. And if you write a review within, I think it's 24 hours, you get a certain amount. Within 48 hours, you get maybe a little less. So that day, because it was 4 a.m. my time, by that night, there were over 2,000 reviews and people posting pictures and stuff. And the show host had basically recommended, she liked our product so much. She was saying they were so cute that she was decorating her house with our product. And so people were posting pictures of our dryer balls in their kitchen or in a basket <laughs> on the back of their toilet or like as decor in their kid's bedroom. And like, they're literally all over the house. And then some people had put them on their dashboard in their car and like had our little oil with it. And they're like, they're too cute to put in the dryer, you know, and stuff. So <laughs> it was really fun to see how they had literally taken and reinvented the product in the brand in this way that it became this fun lifestyle product. And, and that has actually, that trajectory has continued. 
Yeah, an average brand goes on on a home shopping show typically one to two times in a year, and we just had our tenth show last week. So yeah, so we're we're doing good. We're constantly looking at how we can you know improve and continue to reinvent the wheel. But so far, so good. What did you have like on your manifestation list around that coming through? Like, what exactly did you want? And did it exceed it? Did it match it? How did it shape up? So my initial list was so sad. Like I, I, when I first started, it was like, honestly, I think I had Lacey in my ear or something because I couldn't think of anything. I'm like, I just want to manifest being well and being happy. Like I was sick. And so I put down jeans because I couldn't think of anything. (laughs) What was funny is the jeans I put down, I'd seen them on Instagram. It was a $140 $140 pair of free people jeans. And I found them three days later for, a, I think it was 11 or $19 or something. I think 11 or 13, it was under 20 bucks. And so that was an initial, but then when I started really refining the process and putting things in with respect to the company and work, I started putting things on there. Like first off, getting the show host that I wanted, I wanted a May air date. So when that got moved, I was devastated and I think the July one was better because we broke a show record and they'd never have a new brand do that. So I feel like God, universe, whatever stepped in and was like, let's show them really what this brand has versus putting you in a month that's more predictable for a newcomer to do okay. So it was, I feel like divine intervention for sure. I've put in a number of things around new product development and then actually on programs in Nepal. So, and, and certain things have come to fruition and us being able to have 450 women working for us full time. Now that's a huge step in the direction that I want to take the brand. And so now I have a number of things on my manifestation list regarding scaling in the U S. So. I think that is a really good note too, about, okay, I had that I wanted this very specific date in May. And this is why I think we had a clip about this recently, but it's really the feeling And what do you think that the manifestation is going to bring you? So like the air date in May is like, I want that because I know that's like the best sales month or whatever. That's the best programming spot. But really what you want is the most potential for success for your company. You know, in the human brain, we're like, oh, well, that makes sense with that. It's very like logic based. But manifestation is like magic. It's seeing something that you can't even see which is that if you actually take this lower spot, you have more potential for success, which is ultimately what you wanted for the brand. So I think when people write down very specific things, that's amazing, but be open to that or better. Like be open to what else can unravel if it's not exactly that thing. Yeah, I think I'm trying more routinely to not lock myself in. When we lock ourselves into an ideal then you miss out on so much potential. You know, May for me meant security. It meant security and catching people before they were on summer holiday and like the viewership numbers would be there to possibly garnish the sales that we really wanted. When really the impact we had was so much bigger with the date we were given. The way things kind of transpired with Nepal missing some deadlines and stuff really allowed for us to iron out some issues right out the gate to establish some protocols from day one, which was good. It really gave me visibility of what I was dealing with and things I had to talk through and and safeguards that I needed to put in place on both sides. So you know here at TBM, we are always looking for what is the natural, clean way to approach holistic living mind, body, and soul from the inside out. And one thing recently I was having trouble with is I had high levels of stress, which was causing inflammation and my metabolism was running way slower than it used to. So I was looking for something that could really help with inflammation, fortify gut health, all of those things. And I am so excited to announce our brand new sponsor. I am obsessed with their product. It has been, oh my gosh, my saving grace for all of this, Armra Colostrum. If you haven't heard of colostrum, it is literally the first piece of nutrition that we receive when we are born. It contains all of our essential nutrients that our bodies need in order to thrive. And Armra created a proprietary blend of bovine colostrum that harnesses over 400 living bioactive nutrients that will rebuild the barriers of your body and fuel your cellular health. 
It strengthens your immunity, ignites your metabolism, helps with anti-inflammation, fortifies your gut health, activates hair growth, skin radiance, helps your fitness performance, helps with energy recovery. It is truly the most magical superfood ever. And Armour's Colostrum is fully sustainably sourced with colostrum from grass-fed cows at their co-op dairy farm. They only use the surplus supply of colostrum after all the cows are fully fed, so it is really animal-friendly. And they use cold chain biopotent technology, which helps the process of preserving the integrity of all the bioactive nutrients in the colostrum, which also removes the casein and fat. So if you have a lactose allergy, which I honestly do, I usually have to take a lactate pill anytime I have real cheese, this should not bother your stomach. Obviously test it, each case is individual, but I am someone who is gets so bloated from any dairy products out there, and this actually helps prevent against that. My inflammation and bloating specifically around my stomach and face has gone down significantly. My nails and hair have been growing like wildfire. It gives me more energy. And honestly, at times that I might be eating things that are outside the norm or maybe have a little bit more processing in them, if I take some of the armor before, it actually helps protect my gut so much better. It is like a extra line of defense. It also protects your immune system stronger than the flu vaccine. You should see the studies on this. It's absolutely insane. So highly recommend it. Check it out online. If you are interested in trying some, we have a special offer for you guys. You can receive 15% off your first order. Go to tryarmra.com backslash TBM. Again, that is dot com slash TBM. And enter the code TBM, all caps, to get 15% off your first order. How do you see your intuition communicating with you? Because I feel like so many people ask this question a lot, and it seems like as you've unblock so much and had so much space with your inner child and all of that deeper connection. I feel like when we unblock so much, it also deepens our intuition on so many levels because that channel of communication, hearing what is our magnetic self and what is not our magnetic self becomes very clear. We know what's anxiety versus magnetism, you know, our true wisdom. So how does that come through for you? It's funny. Like I, even towards the end of the challenge, I had a few things that was coming through. And a lot of times it's in my mind and it's in my body. And so when I'll meditate or do a DI, I can feel things usually in my gut, but I also, I'll be thinking things and then I'll feel how it's connected to my gut. And a lot of times what I'll think as an intuitive ping is actually, and I'll, I'll think like, oh, I shouldn't do dot, dot, dot. It's fear. And so I actually have gotten to where I'll take what I think initially is a ping and then dial it in over a few days and and really release and try and get to the root of it. Because I do think that I still have an innate sometimes sense of fear that will hold me back. And when I process through it just over a few days, even I'll go, wow, I didn't realize that that was connected to X, Y, Z. And then it's like this release. And then the real ping comes through. I, I, I never thought I could create a business that would incorporate giving back and helping women and children, creating and, and interior design, my international connections and what I've built over 25 years of working internationally and still get to do a little consulting with people and brands that I love. I mean, literally never in my mind would I have said you can combine all these things and, and still work under a 40 hour work week and have a free, you know, free time, a free life and connected relationships and things. I never would have thought I could do that. It's amazing. That is a really big point I want to highlight as well, because I know when we initially talked to you were mentioning the impact of like nature and animals and getting back to your roots and international travels and philanthropy from your mom, how so many of these things really were were part of your authenticity even as a kid and how now they're translating into your career and passion too. And I think for so many people, when they do transition careers, the beauty industry is very different than home goods. Like they are very different industries. So for people who were at that point where they're like, okay, this, this route that I was going forth 
isn't aligned anymore. I think a lot of people are hitting that with their careers in different ways, some by their own volition, some because the industry and the world and everything is changing. I mean, everything with AI is probably going to shake things insanely for people who are like, okay, how can I take all my knowledge, my wisdom, like my, my craft, my specialty and continue on providing and creating a living, a living for myself. What are some piece of advice you would give someone who is, I know on the other side, they're going to be like, oh, thank God I had all these skill sets because it led to this. But when you didn't know that yet, what would be some advice you would give yourself? I think one of the biggest things is do things that you love and you can get paid for them. But I've never been shy of having hobbies and exploring hobbies. I really love interior design. So I would take interior design classes, even though I was doing beauty or I went and took upholstery classes at a trade school for multiple semesters just to, as a side thing because I wanted to learn. And I ended up meeting my best friend who now we do all sorts of things together. And I've incorporated that into a lot of the design work I'm now doing on home goods. A lot of like kind of you touched on things from my childhood and I, I TBM really sparked this too, is getting back to little things that brought me joy. And then oddly enough, there would be a way of weaving it in to what I was doing work-wise, but it wasn't like I ever sought out to go, okay, how can I combine and, and marry all these things together? It was that I was actually pursuing things that made my soul sing and, and made me happy. It's funny, like as a kid, I had my little farmer's market stand on a corner in the summers where I would sell our honey, our honeycomb fruit, and then we'd make our own jams and stuff. And I would take all my animals out and offer people like to pet them and pay for it, of course. <laughs> but um, I had, you know, all sorts of bullfrogs and guinea pigs. And we, the dog was like ancillary because it was too normal. But, you know, my <laughs> brother and I wanted to think that we lived in the country. But um, really for me, the, the animals and even the creativity with making jams and the honey and everything was an outlet of peace in the home for me to have connection with living beings that there was no requirement of anything it's funny in these last few years, I have two new rescue dogs. And I, I think I've told you that I've found two guinea pigs at random hiking here in LA. Yes. Share, yeah. the, share the guinea pigs, right? It is the most kismet, magical. Yeah. So I was on a hike. So I had had two dogs previously that passed away at 17 and a half and 15 and a half. And the, the 17 and a half, half year old right before the pandemic. And I wasn't going to get another dog. And something in me when I saw a friend's rescue post this dog that was a Costa Rican street dog, I nabbed her and it was one week before the pandemic started. She is a little bit of a huntress. And so her name's Lula. And so I adopted her and then a second dog, a second rescue. And on a random hike here in LA on a frontage road off of La Brea, Lula lunged into a bougainvillea bush. There's no houses or anything on the road. And I heard a squeal. And I kid you not, I was like, oh my gosh, could it really be a, this dream come true? It's a guinea pig. And so I went and tied the girls up to a tree and I'm like crawling under this bougainvillea bush. And there was a guinea pig that had cuts all over its back and had probably been attacked by a cat. So I got the girls home as fast as I could and started going and feeding it each day and then took and hit a cage in the bush and then caught it and brought it home. And his name was Pico. And I tried to find the family. And when I couldn't, I got him a brother. And for a year and a half, had them. And just, they brought me so much joy and peace. And the peace I got in my nervous system from holding and feeding them and this sense of connection as I was going through all this work, because I was working through some incredibly heavy things that really had me slightly reclusive socially for a while. Not in a sense that I didn't want or love my friends or people in my circle, but that I just didn't have the emotional energy for it and I didn't have the bandwidth. And so having animals and this sense of community in my home was just amazing. I did not know that that both Pika was going to get really sick and that so was Peppa. And, and literally about six weeks, four to six weeks before both of them passed away, I ended up finding on another hike a little girl guinea pig. Ugh. I was walking my dogs and I thought it was a baby skunk because she was black and white and she was having seizures. And I was like, I, I, as a kid, I wanted a skunk. And so I'm like, oh my gosh, is that a baby skunk? <laughs> I'm like, no, 
God's giving me another guinea pig. And like, I literally got a second guinea pig, brought her home and um, ended up getting her sisters after the two boys passed. And so, yeah, I wasn't done with my little menagerie here. What are the odds of like, you hear of stray dogs, stray cats, you know, different animals, skunk makes more sense, but a random stray guinea pig right? twice. It's outside of a rec center in this like grassy area. Like I, and I, there's a bunch of stray cats. I think it had been attacked by a cat. I, I couldn't believe it. I was like, you've got to be kidding me right now. Just the, the timing of it as well. And it's funny. I think I, you know, I know I told you this on the call, but I was listening to Mark Groves on a road trip and he had on this neuroscientist that was talking about kind of recalibrating your nervous system and how skin to skin contact with a human that is in a healthy and neutral place is really good, but also animal contact and like on your skin. And she said, if you can get them on your heart or on your chest, your body actually will acclimate to their nervous system. And she's like, you know, like a guinea pig or a rabbit, but like guinea pigs are great. And she goes, and feeding them, you really go into the zone. And I'm listening to this and I'm like, that's it. I was in a trance. It was the most interesting thing. I think that, I mean, is so, so cool to hear too, the the healing power of animals and like why we feel so grounded and calm around them and how to like co-regulate with them. It is such a beautiful if you have pets or animals that you can, you know, cuddle with or have skin to skin contact with, I think can be such a powerful healing tool for the nervous system and helping you regulate. Absolutely. Yeah, it was amazing. Talk a little bit about pivoting in career, you know, from the beauty sector into and and we talked about it on our call too, like this, what did you call it? It was like a closed cycle. So Hustle and Blush, what I wanted to create was it basically is a reinvestment cycle. It's it's creating a a loop. It's a form of conscious capitalism, basically. But um, I really got the inspiration from my cousin's nonprofit. And so this this type of model is more typical of a nonprofit, but or of like a religious probably organization. I look at it as as being ethical to those that that your goods are reliant upon for, for success. So basically when I started creating the brand, knowing that I wanted to work with specifically women more in developing markets that are coming from communities that are more disenfranchised and, and maybe they're deemed not as hireable as other members of society. I, I wanted to look at, okay, how can we not only give them a work environment that allows them to thrive and creates an opportunity where they can create stability and potential for for their their family and their children in the future, but also where they feel value and feel feel witnessed and feel a sense of belonging. And there are certain elements in U.S. work culture that create that, whether it be job security and or health benefits, days off, you know, a sense of community and camaraderie with a team, things like that. So how can we create an environment that allows them to thrive in that like mind, but then after we make money off of these products that they're helping us create, how can we look at reinvesting back into their market and into their social infrastructure that helps create longstanding change as well and, and, and impact? So from my stance, it's it's looking at, at it from a real communal lens of if we're going to benefit off of your skill set, then you should also benefit off of our reward. I think the basis is in community partnership and, and giving dignity. As I've grown and become more whole, I guess you would say, there's this sense of belonging and compassion that continues to grow for those that don't necessarily have similar opportunities. The women that that work on our all of our goods and stuff, we wouldn't have a brand without them. So for me, they're they're intrinsic to what I'm doing. And it's it's probably the biggest privilege in my what I get to do with my work is that that partnership and getting to work with them. And I love to, you know, you kind of said how you were you were on this liaison between honoring their traditions, their culture, but also like, okay, how can you guys elevate and potentially sell to new customers, new people, and then talking with your other clients in Korea and you're like, okay, wow, you guys are so good at making such a perfect product, but could we maybe like ease up here and, do, you know, like it's kind of this beautiful blend and dance of how can all of our gifts shine? 
how can we elevate all of our gifts and kind of work together on things? And I don't know, this is just something I've been thinking about personally, as we're, the world is changing, evolving, like how can we be inspired by companies like yours, you know, and see like, wow, what are different ways that we can make a difference in the world? And I, I wanted to highlight this specific part around this, this loop, because I think it's really inspiring and any listeners out there who are starting their entrepreneurial business, start thinking about those things. Cause I think there's going to be a lot more of that in the future as well. Yeah. I think it's interesting. I think, you know, growing up my mom, her way, I think of navigating and managing a really difficult household was always looking at how she could give to somebody less fortunate or give help someone else out. And I think there is something to be said for as you prosper, if you are inclined to look at how you can help someone else prosper too, it's amazing what it does to the soul and also to your consciousness as far as like what, what you see in this world. It's been incredibly enlightening to me and the opportunities that have come forth from the partnerships that I have in Nepal and the things that happen when I'm there. You want to talk divine encounters and stuff. It's, it's pretty unbelievable. And it's just an incredible blessing to get to do what I do. That's also really rooted down to the idea of abundance. Abundance is not cultivate, 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 and hoard all of your money and, and resources and gifts and talents and all the things. Abundance is a loop. Abundance is I know there will be more. I'm supported. I'm held. I can give my gifts freely. I can obviously charge for them and knowing the worth, but then also give back and do this. It's like this full loop that as it comes in, it goes out and it's cycling in and out. And I think people sometimes see abundance as just like an influx of receiving, but it is a influx of receiving and giving at the same time. I think it's amazing when women especially really rise up to help other women and em empower other women to be successful because I believe that's what's going to shake and change this world. So yeah, it's, I do think abundance plays a huge role in that and releasing a mentality of um, scarcity for sure. There are so many people out there settling for unfulfilling relationships or people who are stuck in toxic jobs, living in places and spaces that don't inspire them, and especially people who feel like they'll never be able to afford the things and the life that they truly desire. How do I know that? Because it was me before I discovered that manifestation is actually a totally viable, scientifically proven method of creating the life you want. I'm Lacey, I'm the founder of To Be Magnetic, and if you're not familiar with us, we at TBM offer workshops that teach you how to manifest literally everything from love to money to career to beyond. Our courses are the most effective manifestation method on the market, and that's because of a secret that I discovered years ago about manifestation, which is you do not manifest from your thoughts. You manifest from your subconscious beliefs. So after decades of client research and input from leading doctors and therapists, we design courses that help you rewire your subconscious mind to align with what you want to manifest. And the best part of all for any skeptic out there, our work is completely scientifically proven to work. Just ask the tens of thousands of members inside our Pathway membership, which gives you unlimited access to all of our workshops, tools, and offerings that you'll use over the course of a year. This includes workshops on inner child, shadow, boundaries, love, money, the infamous ruts, and the horrible rock bottoms, and so much more. Use our special code EXPANDED, all caps, E-X-P-A-N-D-E-D, -E -D, to receive $20 off your first TBM purchase. Again, that's all caps, EXPANDED, E-X-P-A-N-D-E-D. -E -D. Okay, now back to the episode. What is your relationship with your parents today? Because I know you talked about boundaries a lot. And yes. so I'm thinking now for the listener who's like, gosh, yeah, I have some very difficult dynamics with certain family members. How 
do they play a role in your life now, given a lot of the healing that you've done around that stuff? So my mom and I are incredibly close. And I think I, the healing that I've experienced in the last two years has been exponentially ratcheted up because of her willingness and ability to process through and for us to talk through a lot of this together and listen without feeling attacked or feeling that I am holding her responsible for certain things, but more just voicing and and processing with her. So it's been incredible. Our friendship has really bloomed from the transparency and like the conversations we've been able to have. My brother and I do not talk to, and, and my mom as well, to our dad. It's been about 17 years now. That probably was the healthiest choice I've ever made in my life. And sticking to that boundary has has allowed for so much healing. And I can fully embrace and, and feel for the way he grew up and, and certain things that he went through without having to experience the chaos. In his case, he's just really unhealthy. There was a lot of illicit activity going on. There was just a complete lack of a desire for a lack of accountability and transparency and honesty and, and stuff like that. So what was beautiful that did come of it, when my parents got divorced, my mom ended up marrying somebody that we had known our whole lives. Actually, they kind of grew up together. He was a family friend, and they've now been married for over 15 years. Their relationship has been so healing to my brother and I, because we get to see wow. her treated with integrity, with honesty, with unconditional love, so much respect. And he's so honorable to her. And the way he treats her, he treats us. She's not codependent like she used to be. She actually is full of joy and is so fun and funny and just at ease. Like she's not jumpy and on edge and fearful. And she's a completely different person. And how old was your mom when she remarried? Just for expansion for other people out there too? Probably close to 60. That is so cool. Yeah. Yeah. Right around 60, I think. So cool. Yeah. Like 59, 60, something like that. Yeah. They love each other. It is the cutest. It's really freaking cute. It's a joy and a privilege to watch it and experience it. What's fun is, is his family thinks the same and it's just really, it's amazing. It really is. It's very healing. I think that is such a powerful thing too. And Lacey and I were talking with Janelle about this, how when you remarried, especially if there's kids, you know, on either side, how that relationship, the kids are partially manifesting that new parent that comes in because there's so much opportunity for healing for the whole family, seeing a secure relationship dynamic as a model there too. It's really interesting. So his, my stepdad's ex-wife had early onset Alzheimer's. My mom in my 20s had cancer and my dad was off who knows where. And so I was taking her to church and my stepdad and his ex-wife and their daughter were sitting in the row in church behind us. And her cognitive capacity wasn't necessarily in the present moment. She was the sweetest, loveliest lady. And my mom ends up getting a card in the mail a few days later where Ruth had described in almost like a poem how she was going to be a bird on a wire watching us and um, watching us in the future. And she would be enjoying peering upon and watching us um, all be together. At that time, I had ended up having two separate dreams over the course of a few years that Noel was my dad. But at the time my parents were still married, his wife was still alive. And this was probably like four or five years prior to my parents even starting to date and now being married. Wow. Yeah. So, and, and my mom ended up having a dream too. All of us were getting messages. The universe was really like, this is your soul connection. Like yes. keep going in this direction. There was divine interception on multiple fronts where that when it happened, I was like, oh, of course, this, I knew this was going to happen years ago. Yeah. Wow. Actually, J- Janelle's been a huge expander for me. Her story and her transparency and her eloquence and sharing has been very expansive. She's really fantastic. And I think the thing that one of the many things I love about Janelle is that she is not afraid to go into the thick of it on her own healing. She's like, okay, that's coming up. We're going to dive in. Let's go. Like she gets so excited by the opportunity for deeper and deeper healing, which I think is a very brave thing to do. 
Yeah. I did your workshop on, was it resentment? It was resentment, right? Resentment, and yep. She did a, you guys did an episode um, shortly thereafter where she, or, and it might have been actually in the workshop too, where she talked about the grief underneath it. Yes. And I was like, that rascal. Cause she was, I had no idea. And she was so right. Like literally I felt like she was talking directly at me. Everything she said around it, I, my mind was blown and it was 100% the case. I was going to ask that too, with the dynamic with your dad, how do you work with grief that comes up around that dynamic? I'm sure there's many layers and levels and elements to it, but how do you typically work with that? I think for so long, I didn't allow myself to be angry. The betrayal and the anger was one of the hardest things. I was so ashamed more than anything because our family was very well respected in, in the community and stuff like that. I wasn't as involved in church and stuff. I've kind of pulled away from that quite a bit, but my parents were really involved. And yet he was essentially living a double life where there were other siblings and things like that, other women and in multiple states and things and all sorts of other financial misgivings and things going on as well. That kind of all came out at once. I really tapped into not just grief, but rage that I had literally shoved down and not allowed myself. I I think I kind of numbed out and hid from because of all the shame surrounding it. So I think acknowledging and allowing myself to grieve the loss of who I thought existed and then the person that really was there. But then along with that, how right I had been all along when I was uncomfortable and felt a, a real disconnection and felt really like a clapping monkey that needed to perform to keep peace, yet couldn't be my authentic self and felt very disconnected and used in a lot of ways. Allowing those layers to just kind of release has been so freeing. And to also tell myself, like, you were a-okay all along and like, it's okay to have coping mechanisms, you know, like really the grace component and the unconditional Mm -hmm. love for my younger self to go, you were doing the best that you could, you didn't know. I imagine too, so many, like the clapping monkey imagery of thinking of like the little kid that's like, please just like, let it all be okay. Like my heart just breaks for your inner child for that. Yeah, the rage that I was so fearful that I tried so hard to be so good. And my brother got a horrible brunt of it too. And it just, I look back and it's so nice to be beyond, like on the other side of it. And I do ache for, for my younger self. I have so much compassion for her. That sentence is just ping ponging in my ears. Like the rage I felt for how hard I tried to be so good. Wow. Yeah. So, so powerful. What's been interesting is to have those conversations with my mom now where she could see, for instance, one of the things that came up in the inner child workshop. So I started having horrible tantrums as a kid and we're talking, Jessica, I could have won awards. I was (laughs) gifted. I could lay it down and kick and scream and create a scene like nobody's business. But there had been some violations and things going on in our house that we weren't allowed to talk about. And so there was a lot of deceit going on. And as a kid, I was witnessing and seeing and experiencing certain things, yet wasn't allowed to speak. And yet, and it wasn't safe to speak. So it was coming out in tantrums. And the way my parents decided to deal with the tantrums is to basically tell me that they would take pictures and be putting them any boys I was going to date or anything, they would show them pictures of me having a tantrum and they would put them up at my wedding. And so they would take out a camera when I would have these tantrums and I'm literally falling apart. Like the world's coming to an end on the inside. And then I'm being shamed and laughed. Oh, and they would point and laugh and like create this whole thing, trying to shame me into like behaving. And like, I had totally forgotten about it until doing the inner child workshop and that started surfacing. And then my mom and I were able to have conversations about it where she's like, can you believe that we thought that was okay? She now can say, I am so sorry that we ever did that to you, you know, and how horrible that must have felt. I mean, what a, what a full circle healing for her to acknowledge that, to take accountability, to apologize and then be like, I was so wrong. I didn't know. Like that was yeah. so And awful. she wasn't even the instigator or the one really doing it. But yet for her to even say it and like acknowledge that it wasn't crazy of me to internalize it that way was 
honestly really healing. So it was, it was very, she's just been such an integral part of me feeling like I could let so many things go and, and not in an unhealthy way, but like really accept love process and release. I mean, yeah, you even think about the the concept of a tantrum is basically a processing of really big emotions that you have no idea how to move them or what to do with them or how to give words to them or action or anything. So to think that you then probably at a young age associated, well, when I have these big emotional feelings, I'm going to get shame. So I better not have them. I better shove them down, then cause tensions in the gut, like all of those things. It's like that full circle. Totally. Like it really, we weren't supposed to notice or verbalize anything. You were just supposed to keep your mouth shut and give off a certain image. The duality was so crazy making. It's funny. And, uh, in my 20s, it was right around the time, it was actually a little later than when when I had seen my stepdad at the, the church situation. But um, my dad was having an affair and all this stuff is coming out. He's having an affair with someone in Central America. My mom's sick. And he asked for us to go to brunch for my birthday a few weeks early. So we meet at this restaurant and he asked me to come a few minutes before my brother and his fiance. And so we meet at this restaurant and my dad pulls out and shows me this like Burlwood box that was lined in velvet with this beautiful necklace inside. And he's asking me, what do you think of it? And I'm like, oh, it's beautiful. And I'm thinking it's quite a lavish gift for someone turning like 27 or something. He basically ends up telling me it's a push gift for this mistress that's having a baby the day after my birthday. And I'm like sitting there shocked and kind of like, okay, um, just dumbfounded. Yeah. So we go into the restaurant and sit down and we're waiting for my brother and his fiance. And they're getting married like six, eight months later. And my dad said that the real reason, he goes, the real reason I have you here is that um, I need you to talk to your brother. And I said, okay, and about, and he said, well, you know, he and his fiance had um, moved in together. And he said, he needs to move in with you until the, until the wedding, because it looks bad to our friends for them to be living together before marriage. Oh, and I'm like oh sitting God. there and I'm like, Gosh. yeah, like that's the, that that's like the life I lived, like the, the duality of it, where there's one way that one person behaves, but that everybody else is supposed to just kind of fall in line with this, this image. And that, what was funny is we were already figuring out all the stuff and my mom ended up divorcing him pretty shortly thereafter, but it was such a good picturesque experience of the way we grew up and the gravity of how he lived versus, and the, the, the dissonance, you know, between how he lived versus how we were expected to, to live and behave. Well, even him being an enforcer of sorts of the, the moral regulations for everyone else in the family, it's almost as if he is trying to instill upon the family the rules in which he wishes he could live up to himself, but can't even witness, you know, what he's doing. Like the shame is so high. Yeah. It, it, well, and I honestly, the lack of acknowledgement that the rules just don't apply to him. And we grew up that way, that the rules just didn't apply to him, but they did. They were, everyone else was held to the you know highest of standards. You know, for a long time, I abided by that legalism because it kept me sa- safe and it was a survival mechanism, but it's so freeing to like be able to look at that now and have compassion for just getting through it. We've definitely had a lot of people in the community voice similar character traits from parents that it's been really, really strugglesome when they have those certain personality dynamics and how painful it can be. Well, and I think what's hard is that um, a lot of times when a parent exhibits that kind of persona, they're often really overbearing. And so their voice is way more deafening than a parent that is more balanced or really, you know, empowering you to be an adult and be your own person, allowing you to be your own person, you know, or encouraging it. And I guess one, one piece of hope and encouragement, I want to leave anyone else who's like listening. is like, oh my gosh, I went through that. How much healing do I have in front of me now? Like, you know, they're kind of thinking of all of that. When you don't have your needs met, whether emotionally, physically, you know, even if you have parents who had the best of intentions, who gave you everything they possibly could have given 
when it's not exactly what the very individual unique soul of a child needed to feel safe, protected, seen, soothed, all the things, you now have an opportunity as an adult to be that parent, to learn what you needed. And in that process, you're not only healing yourself, you're healing future generations, you're healing others you come into contact with. Like there is so, so much widespread healing that happens when you can understand and excavate and pull that apart for yourself. It is the most powerful gift you can give yourself. It really does snowball to everyone around you, I feel like. And it's been incredibly, for me to heal, it's been really healing to our our whole family because it's spawned healing, not just with my mom, but with my brother and in his relationship and stuff. So it's definitely had an effect on my friendships and it's definitely a multi-generation. It's not just here and now, but I agree, like it's multi-generational and it can go up as well as down. You know, going back to you mentioning like how long I experienced healing really fast as far as it's it's going to come in waves and incrementally. I would say every few months I would notice this sense of lifting where I could feel different forms of release in my soul, in my body, in like levels of tension. And then there, then I'd crawl a little deeper. And, you know, so I think listen to your body, obviously, but I think you can actually experience healing pretty rapidly with this process if you stick to it. But give yourself grace and the ability to also have rest throughout it. At times, I would definitely need to take a little bit of a break because the emotional lifting was so dramatic, really. I mean, and you're also like creating new neural pathways. All of those entrenched programs that are tied to emotional sectors and physiological responses in your body are being overwritten to more positive, helpful ones. That is exhausting. It's a lot of work for your brain. Oh, I was sleeping so much more when I was in the thick of it a lot. Yeah, there were periods where I was like, wow, this is incredibly exhausting. And it's because exactly what you're saying, your mind is working so hard. If you could leave us off on what is the biggest takeaway for you from the two magnetic work? Like what is the impact it had on you? What has it given you just to kind of inspire other people to be like, what can I look forward to? The self-love, I think, is probably one of the biggest and the foundation for sure. The self-love and the worthiness. But I would say joy. Being able to live a life that's really in alignment and embraces so many different things that bring me joy is truly probably the biggest gift. And it, there's a ripple effect to that. Like you guys say, there's magnetism in it. And, and it, it does affect everybody else around me. The joy and the peace component, I think, is probably the biggest for me. When you're truly living in your authenticity, it's infectious. You know, when you love what you do and you're thriving and you're living at a heightened state of reality, I guess, I don't know, it's, it's magnetic. And I think it does draw other people into it. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much, Lisa. This is such a powerful episode. Thank you for being so vulnerable and sharing so much. It's really going to expand so many people who are navigating and feel in similar situations too. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for having me, Jessica. It's been such a pleasure. And honestly, it's been a gift to get to be part of the community here. Thank you. hope you all enjoyed that episode as much as we did. And if you're starting to get a feel for this to be magnetic manifestation process, but aren't completely sold yet, let me point you to some of our free offerings. You can check out the expanded podcast episode called how to manifest anything you desire where Lacey, the founder and I break down exactly what this process is all about. You can check out The Motivation, which is our testimonial library with thousands of testimonials of people who have manifested wild things using this process. And right now we have our magnetic self challenge going on. It is not too late to join. You can start living as your most confident self in just six weeks, sign up anytime and walk through step-by-step as we reconnect you with your high self-worth, your intuition and face your fears to become a completely upgraded version of self in six weeks. Enjoy. We'll see you next week.